I have a scenario for you. It's probably pretty common, all right? We have two uh, persons, Alvin the atheist, Carol the Christian. And um, they're gonna model a conversation here that you've probably had many times before. You can choose which person you are. You may relate more to one than the other, okay? So has this ever happened to you? Or <clears throat> Carol says something like, you're just an atheist because you wanna sin. And Alvin intelligently responds, well, you're just a Christian because you were born in the United States. So, what, 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 what's wrong with this? Is, this? is this a productive conversation? No, of course not. And the reason is pretty straightforward. They're not actually having a conversation. They're psychoanalyzing each other. They're saying, this is why you believe what you believe. This is why you believe what you believe. And if I can correctly diagnose why you believe what you believe, I don't ever have to think about what I believe. So it's a, just a deflection tactic. And at the end of the day, it doesn't get anywhere. Also, both of these arguments are ridiculous. So there's that. Okay, so what might be a better conversation here? Um, we need to get past psychoanalyzing each other and have good faith conversations that respect people for who they are um, and respect them for where they're coming from. So here's another one. So Alvin says, okay, all right, fine, 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 fine. Maybe you have good reasons for being a Christian. So let me ask, you may be a Christian, but why, why should I believe anything of what you're saying? And Carol says, well, when I was 18 years old, my life was just such a mess. And then Jesus came into my life and made everything different. So, what's wrong with this conversation? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is exactly right. So, uh, that is a uh, really perceptive because he didn't ask why are you a Christian or what led you to be a Christian. What? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's wrong on, on two accounts here. And this is, depending on the circles you run in, this can like, you know, hurt your feelings or hurt some people's feelings because there is a large contingent, particularly of evangelical Christians that say, just share your testimony. This was certainly what I was taught growing up, you know, in, in, in church. Just share your testimony. That's all you got to do. Um, and there's certainly nothing wrong with sharing your testimony in the right circumstance. But you have to appreciate the question here. So uh, the analysis that I had is that Alvin and Carol are not having the same conversation. Alvin is asking about the propositional claims of Christianity and why he should think that they are true. But um, by, by giving her personal testimony, Carol is not engaging in that discussion. So it ends up leaving Alvin feeling disrespected and he's possibly thinking ill of Carol, thinking, well, you didn't answer my question. Am I supposed to change my mind based on an experience that, that you had? Um, and uh, as was pointed out earlier, why should I believe Christianity is not the same question as why do you believe Christianity? Sam? Also, it may not be a function of the testimony, but if you give your, if you say, Jesus made the difference in my life and he can make a difference in yours too, mm -hmm. so then they might be insulted. Well, possibly, yeah. I mean, that, that's a little bit of a, a, better, uh, a better response. And I mean, there are certainly people that re respond to that. But if they're not asking that question, right. then, then that's not answering it. Okay. So we now have two things. So first, we need to engage in good faith, respect other people. And second, we need to actually have the same conversation and to answer the questions that are really being asked. So let's iterate again here. So Alvin is going to say the same question. He says, okay, well, that, that's a great story, and I'm glad that, you know, your personal uh, life is enriched by your religion, but why should I think any of that, and why should I believe that? And so Carol says, well, if the sun was closer to the earth, we would burn up, and also Josephus says something about Jesus, so that means that Christianity is true. So, so, what's, <laughs> so what, what's the issue here? Yeah? Yeah, are, Sam? Aren't they standing a, a little bit close together? <laughs> <laughs> this was, uh, this is uh, that, old, older that's picture. Really not, it's a New Zealand. Yes, yeah. you're really not giving him, I don't know how he's going to, he's not going to follow that. That's mm -hmm. not, that's not.
it's not adequate. So, yeah. So here, here's the thing. So we've, she's engaging in good faith, and she's listening to his question, and she's responding appropriately. The problem now is just with the content of what she has to say. She hasn't thought about it recently, or maybe she doesn't understand the arguments, but she's trying to say, well, I know there are reasons to, to believe Christianity, but, uh, and there's something kind of like this. So this is pretty much as good as uh, you can get for an extemporaneous conversation, unless Carol actually knew you know, a lot of detail about the content. All right? um, and I know that we've been mean to Carol here, so let's be uh, mean to Alvin for a minute. So Carol says, well, why do you think Christianity is false? And Alvin says, because monkey. Darwin said that gen Genesis is fake, therefore Jesus didn't exist. Okay, same issue. Now he's familiar with a couple of loose arguments for against Christianity, but because he hasn't thought about it, you know, he they're not they're not accurate. Um, so what we have here with the you know the sun's close to the earth and something about G uh, Josephus or you know Darwin Genesis and you know Jesus being fake. So the thing is that all of those things, all of those claims actually have behind them formal, serious arguments that are under discussion. Um, if you want to know about evolution in Genesis, we talked for like three weeks about that last semester. Um, whenever Alvin's talking about did Jesus exist as a historical person, uh, we'll talk about that this semester. Um, and then the same thing with what Carol was saying about Josephus and the earth being you know, close to the sun. All of these have serious arguments. So just because some person that you talk to or some version that you hear isn't the most refined, that doesn't mean that there's not a very serious uh, claim that's behind it. So this is where we're going to go to the next step. And now we're actually going to refine those arguments and dig into them, look at what the, the best presentations are and analyze them and evaluate them. So how do we have a better conversation? So this is what our goal for the semester is going to be. First, we're going to engage in good faith. So that means here, you know, this is, I know I'm kind of lecturing right now, but this is supposed to be a conversation with everybody here. Um, and so with each other, with me, and uh, with the content that we present, we want to engage in good faith. There's no psychoanalyzing. There's no, you know, ignoring certain views. There's no misrepresenting views or anything like that. I think that intentionally misrepresenting a view is the worst thing you can do because it wastes time, because now the other person has to correct your uh, uh, mistaken impression, and it's incorrect, because if you're not responding to what they're actually saying, then it's not actually true. So that's the first thing, but good faith isn't quite enough. Good faith is good, obviously, um, but the, the content has to be there too. So what we're gonna do uh, this semester is, um, instead of just looking at sort of random versions of arguments, we're actually going to be presenting some of the more contemporary versions of uh, these arguments. Um, but obviously we can't go down the entire rabbit hole. All the topics we talk about this semester have had literally books upon books upon books written about them. And each meeting is only going to be about an hour. So there's going to be a limitation there. Um, but we want to at least do the best that we can to show you where the, the cutting edge uh, is. Um, and give you accurate information so you can evaluate it. Okay, so those are the goals. Um, so those are sort of meta goals to this question of how to have a good conversation. So correct information and good, good faith. So now I want to get a little bit more uh, into that content and um, look at this question. So Alvin says, what should I, why should I think any of what you're saying is true? So how should Carol respond? All right. And the question is not what sentence does she need to say, but what is her overall like strategy going to be? Um, so uh, there's this verse in 1 Peter that gets a lot of traction. In your hearts, uh, honor Christ the Lord as holy, being uh, prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So, I mean, uh, legally, as a Christian, Carol has to answer this question. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you, can't, you can't get out of it, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So he's asked, why should I think what you're saying is true? Why do you believe what you believe? Um, and so that's what First Peter says. Now, in the history of Christianity, there have been a lot of different approaches and versions of how to approach this question. Uh, and I don't want this to turn into like a methodology dump, so I'm just going to give you like the briefest sketch, just so you're familiar with some of these other versions, and also so you understand what our overall meta strategy will be for this semester. 
Um, so this comes from this book, uh, Five Views of Apologetics. It's published by Zondervan. Again, evangelical publisher, and I think all of the contributors are themselves evangelical. Um, the Catholic Church has its own uh, branch of apologetics, as it does its own thing, um, and it's a, little bit, it's a little bit different. So I'm definitely, the information here is a little biased in that respect. Um, so one version is what's called presuppositionalism, um, and this is like, if you want to name uh, Van Til, who's the guy that does this, uh, Cornelius Van Til. And essentially, presuppositionalism is probably, I, I think it's honestly one of the weirder views. It's very difficult to understand, um, and, it, and personally, I don't find it all that persuasive. Um, but essentially, the, the, the core thesis of presuppositionalism is there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every person comes to every question with presuppositions, some type of intellectual baggage. And because of that, whenever you analyze the arguments and evidence for and against Christianity, you can either come to them uh, with a hostile mind that is against God or a proper, you know, sanctified mind that is with God. In other words, if you're an atheist and you read the Bible, you're going to stay an atheist. If you're a Christian and read the Bible, you're going to stay a Christian. And so their argument is the atheist presuppositions are wrong, so you need to be a Christian instead. Uh, it takes different versions and flavors. One might be that uh, the Christian worldview is the only one that makes sense of everything in the world. Uh, for example, uh, they might say something like mathematics is only possible uh, if the triune God of Scripture is real. Um, we're not going to talk about that one, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but if you're interested in that, you can obviously read this book, Five Views on Apologetics, or Cornelius Van Til is the uh, main name behind that. Sam has a comment? Who in the book uh, is the presuppositionalist? Oh, that would definitely be John Frame. Yeah, I, yeah, John Frame is the guy. So uh, presuppositionalism is really popular in like reformed groups where you have uh, what's called like total depravity. They basically say that because of the noetic effects of sin, everybody on the earth is under the curse of God. So if you have an unregenerate mind, if your mind is not regenerated by the Holy Spirit, you can't think properly. Um, and that's more or less what they think. Yes? So one thing I've never understood about presuppositionalism is it seems like sometimes they say it's somehow dishonoring to God to take one of these other approaches because oh, it yeah. puts man as the judge or something like that. Yeah, or, exactly. Or they seem to be saying that like those other approaches won't be effective and your mm -hmm. other approach is more effective, which seems like you can evaluate empirically. Or yeah. The, yeah. Um, so if we go back. Uh, so Alvin says, why should I think what you're saying is true? Carol, if she's a presuppositionalist, will say Paul, the presuppositionalist. He'll say, who are you, O oh man, to dare judge what I have to say? Like, you, you are uh, a sinner before God. You can't, you're not in a position to evaluate arguments and evidence. It doesn't matter what you think. You either repent or, uh, well, that's more uncharitable way of doing it. But yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the, the kind of the foundational piece of presuppositionalism is is total depravity. Uh, I mean, it, well, it, that, that it, it can be. The reason is yeah. so is so fractured that there's no way um, you can that we can't offer reasons because you yeah. can't properly. It, yeah, exactly. But what's the foundation of total depravity if it's the truth of Christianity? So you have to argue kind of in a circle. Yeah, you almost have, yeah. It's it's a very sort of circular approach, I think. Now, I don't want to turn this into a presup like. Uh, bashing session so and and if i talk too extemporaneous i'm going to be a little too biased so let me just say this uh presuppositionalism does have one very important component that is a hundred percent true which is nobody is neutral when you come there's no such thing as uh the ideal thinker who has uh no influences no backgrounds uh you know no no influence on their thinking no biases everyone has biases and you need to be sensitive to those biases um, but is being aware of those biases, is that sufficient for an apologetic method? Personally, I'm not persuaded uh, that it is. Um, so uh, that, that's uh, that view. Okay. Why did I, I did not mean to put in this order. Sorry, skip over Reformed epistemology for a second. Um, on the far end of the other se uh, of the spectrum is the evidential approach. And the evidentialist says, uh, it's super easy. If someone asks you why you believe something, you bring evidence. It is wrong at all times everywhere to believe anything on insufficient evidence. Christianity is no exception, so we bring evidence to the table. Um, 
And typically this approach focuses on like the miracle claims of the Bible. This is like the main thing. They say that the Bible is, is historically accurate, the resurrection of Jesus is historically verifiable, and because of that, that's what grounds your belief in uh, Christianity. And so sometimes it's referred to as a one-step argument in that if you say, God ra- if you say his- in history, God raised Jesus from the dead, that alone establishes the entire truth of Christianity. You don't have to deal with any other argument, just that one. Um, so this approach, I think, also has the same, or it has the inverse problem as the precept approach which is that uh, the precepts say that biases are everything, evidentialists say biases are nothing, or that biases can be, fundamentally they can be accounted for. Um, I don't think that that's going to be sufficient uh, on its own. The other thing is, um, if you say something to the, the other thing I think is very important with evidentialism is if you try to make the argument God raised Jesus from the dead, I don't think that you can argue that from historical evidences alone. Because if you argue with somebody who, in their view of the world, does not allow for supernatural intervention, they're never going to be able to interpret a historical event in a miraculous way. So if you say to someone who is like tried and true, like hard atheist, who says, I am certain there is no God and there is nothing beyond the material world, if you give them material evi- or sorry, if you give them uh, uh, historical evidence, I don't think you're ever going to get past that barrier. They can always reinterpret it. They can always you know, look at it from a different perspective. So um, those are the two ends of the spectrum. Now, uh, this other view up here is called reformed epistemology. And this is uh, kind of seesawing back to the other end of the precept view, um, but not all the way to the precept view. Reformed epistemology essentially says, evidence is good and it's true, but it's not necessary for Christian belief. You can believe independent of evidence and be warranted in your belief of the evidence and I didn't finish my sentence there, but we'll actually uh, touch on this at the very end of the semester. Um, Which, uh, this now leads to the the last approach, which is what um, we'll actually be spending a lot of time on, which is called uh, natural theology. But let me just pause real quick, um, because I was kind of cursory with these three views. Were there any questions or comments about these uh, sort of three perspectives? Sam has a comment. There's also, or at least I've always been taught, the distinction between a, a one-step and a two-step approach. The two-step first tries to establish the existence of God in order mm-hmm. to get around the miracle problem yep. you were talking about, or supposed miracle problem you were talking about. Um, and also, also just because uh, there are some really strong arguments for that first yeah. step. Yeah, I got you. Uh, so let me just ask this real quick. Before right now, how many of you were familiar with these terms? They were up there. A couple? How many for you this is brand new? Like I've never heard this. Okay, good. All right. Well, don't let my biases influence you too much. All right. So uh, this is all just a meta uh, commentary on uh, how do you argue for uh, Christianity. And there are a lot of different approaches. Um, and um, to put my cards on the table, I kind of, I think I've already said, all of these approaches have something that is true about them. They all have some decent contribution. Evidentialists are right in their historical uh, evidential approach uh, to Christianity. Presuppositionalists are right about the importance of biases. Reformed epistemology is right because it's right. Um, (laughs) Well, reformed epistemology is actually a much bigger uh, thing than just an apologetic approach. But... um, in, in other words, you don't have to take one. It's, it's not like you just take one and ride it to the end. You can mix and match as much as you want. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's supposed to say uh, we'll return to reformed epistemology this semester. Uh, since it's its own thing, we'll, we've actually got it separated. Okay. Okay. So. said that the thing theism branding is, is that because we were pretty positive about reformed epistemology as opposed to. No, 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 I think the ism branding is just uh, its own thing. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about natural theology, because this is something that is it's kind of a weird concept, um, especially if you're uh, uh, completely brand new to the, to the concept. So natural theology is opposed to revealed theology. And this is really where that tension between the precepts, uh, presuppositionalists uh, come into play. 
So natural theology, I'll just read the quote here, is the practice of philosophically reflecting on the existence and nature of God independent of real or apparent divine revelation or scripture. So whenever uh, the, the Christian belief about you know, the Bible is that it is a revelation of God. God has truly spoken to humanity through the Bible. Natural theology um, does not consider uh, that section, or it doesn't treat scripture in that way, and it doesn't consider scripture in that way for, for its project. It simply says, we're going to look uh, just to the nature that's outside. So we're going to look at the sky, we'll look at uh, the nature of science, we'll look at the nature of morality, things like that. But we're not going to treat uh, anything as if God has actually spoken. And this is where that theological tension comes, because the presuppositionalists are going to say, if you're a Christian and you think that God has truly spoken, aren't you lying about Scripture? Are you saying that God didn't speak in Scripture? Um, and that's an important thing to consider. Um, and I think that natural theology uh, is something that can be used by a Christian, even you know, if you think the Bible does contain divine revelation. You can say, yes, it does contain divine revelation, but we're going to analyze it through an epistemic framework in which it doesn't. And we'll actually be able to show that even under those more stringent conditions, you can still establish the truth of Christianity. So they're coming from two different directions, yeah. but they're hoping to meet in the middle. Pretty much, yeah, yeah, that would be the way to do it. So um, to give an example here, uh, as, as this guy does in, in this book, um, revealed theology may take as authoritative certain New Testament claims about Jesus and then construct philosophical or theological models for understanding how Jesus may be you know, human or divine. But natural theology develops arguments about gods based on uh, the existence of the cosmos, the very concept of God, and different views of the nature of the cosmos, such as, is ostensible, uh, such as its ostensible order and value. Now, the reason this is important is because the project of natural theology is very reserved. The conclusions of the arguments of natural theology are not, we believe in one God the, uh, Almighty, um, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ is only son. We don't, it doesn't end with that type of a conclusion. It's much more reserved. It's like, we believe, or not we believe, the conclusion is, therefore, a first cause exists, or there is a God, right? So some people say natural theology is terrible because um, it uh, doesn't get you to the God of Christianity. It gets you to a fake God. Right. So now the question here is, how do you bridge the gap? And so this is what's called classical apologetics. And classical apologetics says we're going to take the best parts of all four of these approaches, presuppositionalism, uh, evidentialism, reformed epistemology and natural theology. We're going to take them all and we're going to let them supplement each other so that together they can uh, be mutually reinforcing. So classical apologetics uses the arguments of natural theology to essentially break past that barrier of atheism and says, if the arguments of natural theology are successful, there is a God of some kind that exists. Then you supplement that with the evidential arguments of uh, the uh, resurrection of Jesus, for example, to come to the conclusion that Christianity is true. And then we'll, and reformed epistemology is kind of its own thing, so we'll sort of loop back around and talk about that at the end of the semester. Um, and so here's kind of a way of thinking about it. Uh, yeah? Well, you had a question. I wanted to ask, like, when you think about who you're trying to convince, it seems like apologetics is usually, usually has in mind kind of the, the atheist slash skeptic, mm -hmm. or maybe some other theist, like a Muslim or someone like that, your Muslim friend, and mm -hmm. you, you know, if they argue about what God is alive and what is revealed. Yep. Um, uh, and maybe that's because we kind of live more in the Western world, but is there any way to talk about how apologetics would engage with more Eastern thinking and mm. that sort of thing? I've always been confused about yeah, that's, what that, to, that, that is a very uh, That's a very good question. That's something um, I haven't really uh, thought too much about, but largely just because of the, you know, the, the um, metaphysical structures are so different. And that's the next semester. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> next semester, yeah. Do you have a comment? I was curious about, like, what is specifically different about, like, the Eastern beliefs? It seems like they're not asking the same questions. Mm -hmm. Like, atheists and theists are arguing about some specific question, and then over here, like, that question is not even on the table. That's, that's why I get confused. Okay. When you say Eastern, you mean, like, uh, Buddhism or Hinduism? Buddhism, maybe a little Hinduism, yeah. Confucianism, things I like that. I definitely get what you're talking about with Buddhism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Facts on the table in terms of these kind of arguments. 
Yeah. Well, I, I think it, it work, definitely works differently, but it has the same starting point because mm -hmm. the starting point for all of natural theology is accessible facts of the world, right. of the world and, and human beings, so human mm -hmm. nature. Even though there's, so you would still start with um, what would be common to mm -hmm. even East and West. Now, exactly. then you would get into, but what's the best explanation for those things that we see we have in common? Mm -hmm. And you could bring in their worldview and then show the, right. show the primacy or the, or the best explanation is not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not Hinduism or Buddhism. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, another good point to bring up there is uh, when, when you talk about natural theology, part of the motivation is that not everyone in the world can read, not everyone in the world has ever encountered the Christian scriptures. So with natural theology, you're starting with facts that everyone has encountered. Everyone has encountered the external world. They have encountered uh, you know, their own moral experience, um, things like that. And that's kind of another reason why the presuppositionalist view, I think, is very difficult, uh, or at least certain versions of it. Because if you're trying to make the argument that every person believes in the triune God of Scripture, but somebody doesn't read Scripture, it's very difficult, I think, to, to square that circle. Uh, but presuppositionalism and reformed epistemology also have that concern about people who haven't engaged. That's right. Exactly. And, and, and that's where I think the, the strength of reformed epistemology is that it actually gives an account for how you can believe in Christianity without... Uh, having read the scriptures or uh, having analyzed them deeply. But we'll, like I said, we'll get to that at the end of the semester. It's its own, its own thing. So here's going to be our structure for like the main meat of the semester, uh, which is also the structure of classical apologetics. You start with the foundation of natural theology, which these are arguments towards a first cause, a designer, an ordering being of the universe, um, which again, that is not that's not all the way to the Christian God of Christian confession, but that's useful. The second step then is to respond to objections because just as there are natural theological arguments for the existence of God, there are natural atheological arguments against the existence of God. For example, the problem of evil, that's something that is universally accessible to everyone uh, and can be construed into an argument against the existence of God. So once you successfully defend the arguments of natural theology, successfully respond to objections, then you cap that off with historical arguments for the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and that tells you God exists, um, the objections are insufficient, and uh, this God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus. And that, for the purpose of apologetics, is really about as good as you can uh, uh, get, at least with rational argument, I think. So um, here are going to be what, uh, our specific topics. So next week, we're going to talk about the cosmological arguments. Now, you notice that that's plural. The, uh, the arguments that we discuss are going to be a family of arguments, uh, that they're all distinct and they're all different, but they're all related by some you know, sort of unifying principle. Uh, and then we'll actually talk about one particular version of it. So next, next week, we're gonna talk about the cosmological arguments, uh, specifically um, the one from uh, <laughs> the finite temporal nature of the universe. Uh, which is essentially just, uh, if the universe began to exist, does that point to the existence of God? So that's next week. The week after that, we're going to talk about design arguments. Um, that'll be me. I'm really excited about this. Design arguments, I think, are the most interesting. Um, and specifically, we'll talk about the version from cosmic fine-tuning, which is the, uh, all the rage nowadays in design arguments. Um, and then we'll cap that off with a discussion of moral arguments. So you may have heard... Uh, this uh, phrase before, does the moral law require a moral law giver? That's the sort of intuition that is uh, behind a moral argument. So these three arguments are the big three. How many arguments are there for the existence of God just in general? Well, it depends on who you ask, but this book right here uh, says that there are two dozen or so, and it's pretty meaty. Um, some have estimated there are up to a hundred uh, independent arguments defended in the contemporary philosophical literature. So we're just going to talk about three, um, because honestly, once you get past, there are two dozen in here, right? Once you get past like the sixth one, they start to get really weird um, and, and honestly quite uh, odd. Uh, but these are the big three, the real popular ones. Okay, after that, we're going to turn to the questions of natural atheology. So we're going to spend two weeks on the problem of evil. Uh, the problem of evil has two parts to it. The first is, does evil 
provide evidence against the existence of God? And the second response, or the second question is, if it doesn't, why does God allow evil? So that's the difference between a defense and a theodicy. That's a preview of coming attraction. And then lastly, we're going to uh, spend uh, three weeks on the question of the historical arguments for Christianity, specifically the existence and resurrection of Jesus. So we're going to spend one day just on the question of miracles, one day on the question of the existence of Jesus as a historical person, and then the last day will be the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so that's the last slide that I had. Um, so this is open discussion here. What comments or questions you got? Well, I was going to say the, the missing date of the Veritas form. Oh, yes. On February 18th. Oh, my mistake. It's not up here. Um, <laughs> so that, but that date, uh, the, the main speaker is going to be one of the authors you brought up earlier, J.P. Yep. Moreland. And the main discussion will be on consciousness. I don't know if consciousness provides an argument for the existence it, it, of God, it, but it's like... It is one of the arguments. Argument. Yeah, it's certainly yeah. an argument against naturalism. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's here, uh, by the that's way. Here at, at the yeah. same time and also on a Thursday. So yeah. that's it. it starts at 7. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the last thing, uh, so this is our topic. So the last thing I have is just this is how you can connect with us. Uh, our per, uh, predominant form of communication is over Slack, which is essentially Discord, but with a business tie, and uh, also through email. So that's up there. Um, but yeah, uh, I saw another question or comment. No? Was it Sam? Go ahead. Are we going to get together with the FSA and talk about this? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Yes, Sam. Uh, I, I feel like there is a, a glaring and obvious gap in our schedule. And, you know, it's, it's hard to put my finger on it, but I, I think it rhymes with oh, uh, yeah. tauntological argument. Uh, yeah, <laughs> funny. So the joke here is that the cosmological and design arguments are the heavy hitters of natural theology. Moral arguments are also pretty good. But the, the forgotten... Uh, the black uh, sheep... <laughs> the, the black sheep, the runt, the whatever you want to call it, is what's called the ontological argument, which says, if it's possible for God to exist, then God exists. <laughs> that's the argument. Like, that's the beginning and end of it. Um, it is entirely, it's, it's what's called an a priori argument, so it's completely independent of evidence. There's zero evidence. Uh, it's purely armchair philosophy. So, Kind of no. rooted in language, even. Yeah. Because nope. of the definition of these words. Nobody, everyone agrees that there's something wrong with it, but no one can agree what it is that's wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the I ontological. Don't think would agree mm. with you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, it has to do with conceivability, and there's mm -hmm. a, and so philosophers now don't think that conceivability is yeah. equal to, you know, or has the, the, yeah. the uh, oomph for, you know, possibility. For sure, for sure. Can you go back to, you go back to Carol's conversation? N that's really far back, but sure. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, okay, so let's say that you are having this conversation with Alvin. This one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you're having this conversation with Alvin, and then you get into the conversation, 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 and uh, if she's someone like that, you yeah, should be exactly. inviting to Russia. Christine, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. I think I think that someone like Carol would would be perfect. A well and someone like Alvin. And Alvin. And, and Alvin. Maybe Alvin's already here. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but yeah. Anyway. So. Uh, were there any other comments or questions? Yes, there's no short answer. Exactly. Well. I, yeah. Exactly. It's not a. It's not a very straightforward. Or yeah. It's it's a straightforward question, but it it's something that's occupied. Um, pretty much every Western philosopher for the past three or 4,000 years uh, thinking, so it's... A, yes, yes, exactly. Well, that's actually a really good point. Um, the, the objective for this semester is not, here's a neat argument, memorize it, try it on, on your friends. It's more like um, if you walk through a, a detailed uh, description of these arguments, you understand what they're saying, and you can evaluate if they're persuasive or not. Some of these arguments, frankly, I don't find nearly as persuasive as others. Um, and so there are many Christians, actually, who reject some of the arguments that we'll be discussing. So I don't want to come off as saying, like, oh, you know, this argument's a knockdown argument. It's, this is, these are serious, good arguments. I think they're very good arguments uh, for the truth of Christianity that are worth thinking about, um, and they're worth discussing. Um, and, uh, they're worth 
Yeah. It, it also almost makes a cumulative case. So yeah, it's exactly. not like one argument trumps everything. Exactly. It's like they build on each other, and they can, mm -hmm. and, and the force of the evidence is like cumulative. You know, when you're when you're talking to your friends, um, and it depends on their discipline and everything of what they might be drawn to. You know, science people yeah. love it. You know, right. So, I mean, it really. Yeah, and, and that's a, another really good thing uh, to point out is that things that are persuasive, uh, that things are not necessarily persuasive across the board. One argument that's persuasive, for, you can have two arguments that are equally valid, equally sound, um, but one person finds one persuasive and somebody finds the other one persuasive. Like there are some arguments that um, I, I find, you know, the arguments that keep me up at night against Christianity are not the ones that I've ever seen written about. Not because they're good, but just because they're so, you know, unique or personal to certain circumstances. So, um, anyway, that's all I had. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll be here uh, next week to talk about cosmological arguments. Um, please stick around and chat with either me or Ada or any of the body else that's here. Um, yeah, that's all I had. Thanks. No, don't clap. Don't.